Our book today is Midnight in Chernobyl, the untold story of the world's greatest nuclear disaster by Adam Higginbotham. This is from the prologue. <clears throat> Saturday, April 26, 1986, 4.16 p.m., Chernobyl Atomic Energy Station, Ukraine. Senior Lieutenant Alexander Logachev loved radiation the way other men love their wives. Tall and good-looking, 26 years old, with close-cropped dark hair and ice-blue eyes, Logoshev had joined the Soviet Army when he was still a boy. They had trained him well. The instructors from the military academy outside Moscow taught him with lethal poisons and unshielded radiation. He traveled to the testing grounds of Semipalatinsk in Kazakhstan and to the desolate East Urals Trace, where the fallout from a clandestine radioactive accident still poisoned the landscape. Eventually, Logachev's training took him even to the remote and forbidden islands of Novaya Zemlya, high in the Arctic Circle, and ground zero for the detonation of the terrible Tsar Bomba, the largest thermonuclear device in history. Now, as the lead radiation reconnaissance officer of the 427th Red Banner Mechanized Regiment of the Kiev District Civil Defense Force, Logoshev knew how to protect himself and his three-man crew from nerve agents, biological weapons, gamma rays, and hot particles by doing their work just as the textbooks dictated, by trusting his dosimetry equipment, and when necessary, reaching for the nuclear, bacterial, and chemical warfare medical kits stored in the cockpit of their armored car. But he also believed that the best protection was psychological. These men who allowed themselves to fear radiation were most at risk. But those who came to love and appreciate its spectral presence, to understand its caprices, could endure even the most intense gamma bar bombardment and emerge as healthy as before. As he sped through the suburbs of Kiev that morning at the head of a, a column of more than 30 vehicles summoned to an emergency at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, Logoshev had every reason to feel confident. The spring air blowing through the hatches of his armored scout car carried the smell of the trees and the freshly cut grass. His men gathered on the parade ground just the night before for their monthly inspection were drilled and ready. At his feet, a battery of radiological detection instruments, including a newly installed electronic device twice as sensitive as the old model, murmured softly, revealing nothing unusual in the atmosphere around them. But as they finally approached the plant later that morning, it became clear that something extraordinary had happened. The alarm on the radiation dosimeter first sounded as they passed the concrete signpost marking the perimeter of the power station grounds, and the lieutenant gave orders to stop the vehicle and log their findings. 51 Rochins per hour. If they waited here just 60 minutes, they would all absorb the maximum dose of radiation permitted Soviet troops during wartime. They drove on following the line of high voltage transmission towers that marched toward the horizon in the direction of the power plant. Their readings climbed still further before falling again. Then as the armored car rumbled along the concrete bank of the station's cooling canal, the outline of the fourth unit of the Chernobyl nucle nuclear power plant finally became visible and Logoshev and his crew gazed at it in silence. The roof of the 20-story building had been torn open. Its other upper levels blackened and collapsed into heaps of rubble. They could see shattered panels of ferro-concrete, tumbled blocks of graphite, and here and there the glittering metal casings of fuel assemblies from the core of a nuclear reactor. A cloud of steam drifted from the wreckage into the sunlit sky. Yet they had orders to conduct a full reconnaissance of the plant. Their armored car crawled counterclockwise around the con con complex at 10 kilometers an hour. Sergeant Vlaskin called out the radiation readings from the new instruments, and Logoshev scribbled them down on a map, hand-drawn on a sheet of parchment paper in ballpoint pen and colored marker. One Rochin per hour, then two, then three. They turned left, and the figures began to rise quickly. 10, 30, 50, 100. 250 Rochins an hour! The sergeant shouted, his eyes widening. Comrade Lieutenant, he began and pointed at the radiometer. Logoshev looked down at the digital readout and felt his scalp prickle with terror. 2,080 Rochins an hour, an impossible number. Logoshev struggled to remain calm and remember the textbook to conquer his fear. But his training failed him, and the lieutenant heard himself screaming in panic at the driver, petrified that the vehicle would stall. Why are you going this way, you son of a bee? Are you out of your effing mind? If this thing dies, we'll all be corpses in 15 minutes. Part 1, Chapter 1, The Soviet Prometheus. 
At the slow beat of approaching motor, rotor blades, blackbirds rose into the sky, scattering over the frozen meadows and the pearly knots of creeks and ponds, lacing, lacing the Pripyat River Basin. Far below, standing knee-deep in snow, his breath lingering in heavy clouds, Viktor Brukhanov awaited the arrival of the nomenklatura from Moscow. When the helicopter touched down, the delegation of ministers and Communist Party officials trudged together over the icy field. The savage cold gnawed at their heavy woolen coats and nipped beneath their tall fur hats. The head of the Ministry of Energy and Electrification of the USSR and senior party bosses from the Soviet Socialist Republic of Ukraine joined Brukhanov at the spot where their audacious new project was to begin. Just 34 years old, clever and ambitious, a dedicated party man, Brukhanov had come to western Ukraine with orders to, build, to begin building what would become the greatest nuclear power station on Earth. Midnight at Chernobyl.